The courtroom clips you're witnessing show the moment the defendant takes the stand. It looked like there were goblins, a lot of them, green, ugly little creatures. I've never heard them, not even the hair on his freaking little head. As bizarre as his statements are, the shocking exclusive interrogation footage we obtained reveals even more chilling comments and outlandish stories behind the tragic death of a five-year-old. Stop blaming me for murdering. Nobody said anything about murder. That's what it basically sounds like. I'm not a killer. You really don't know why I know, huh? Okay. Let's see how it is. I won't tell you anything else. Well, guess what? I'm not telling you anything else. I don't like recorder. I'm not much of a media person. Thank you very much. This is 17-year-old Cody Metzger Madsen. He's in an interrogation following the death of his five-year-old foster brother, Dominic Elkins. In about three seconds, you'll hear him say some of the most bizarre things we've ever heard in an interrogation room. There was an ice cream cone side bug, though, that was kind of weird. It looked exactly like an ice cream cone. Yet, I do not understand. It takes aim. And it shoots. I basically had to go through a lot of ice cream to get through. I had to do ground smash, punching, good grief. Anything you say will be get, can and will be used against you in the court of law. I've read that actually on um, Batman before. Mm -hmm. One time when I went on in the ravine all my own, I also saw the same cloaked figure except inside the ravine. And there was also a gun down there. It was had bullets. I don't know who he is or where he came from, but I think he hurt Dominic. I hate that cloak figure, whoever he is. I hate him for killing Dominic. On August 31st, 2013, it was a sleepy Saturday afternoon when foster parents Don and Julie Kuhlman would receive the most concerning news a parent can ever receive. One of their children, Dominic Elkins, had run off after being injured and was now missing. The mystery behind what happened to Dominic on this tragic afternoon will unravel to reveal lies. Nothing in this shocking case is quite as it seems. Dominic Elkins, five years old at the time of this disturbing phone call, was being fostered by longtime specialized foster parents, Julie and Don Kuhlman, in the tiny town of Logan, Iowa. The little boy had only been with the family for a few weeks by this point, but he had seemingly been getting along well with the rest of the family, particularly with the other foster boys who were in the home at the time. On the afternoon of August 31st, 2013, after a morning of waffles and a day spent in the pool, the family had split off, with the father, Don, heading off into town with his friend to meet with his brother for dinner and the mother, Julie, taking her eldest daughter, Rachel, and her friend, Dylan, into town for ice cream. The rest of the kids, Rachel's 12-year-old twin sister, Rebecca, the eldest foster boy, Cody, who was 17, and little Dominic, who was five, all tired from the swim that day, opted to stay home and relax. Ben, the third foster boy in the home, was on a home visit that weekend and wouldn't be at the Coolman's farm during the weekend in question. Everything seemed peaceful and serene that day. But as Rachel Kuhlman explains in this exclusive present day interview, this peace was soon shattered. We lived out in the country, but it was like five minutes or so to get to the little country store to get ice cream. We left my sister who was gonna be like in charge just to keep an eye on the kids. And then it was Dominic and Cody. And we stopped at the front of the property on our way back to chat with my aunt, my grandparents, my aunt and uncles all live on the same uh, 20 acre plot of property. And my mom received a phone call from my sister saying that Dominic was missing. And that we didn't know where he was. Cody was freaking out. He's saying, we don't know where Dominic is. And she wanted us to come home. My mom wrapped up her conversation really quick and we got back in the car, we went home. Apparently, shortly after Julie and the other two children left, Cody and Dominic headed out to play together in the backyard as they had done countless times before, while Rebecca curled up on the couch with a book in the living room. 
Everything seemed fine until, after a while, Cody, crying and upset, stomped back into the house with a bloody mark on his forehead. He explained that while they were playing The Roman Game, a pretend game based on the Percy Jackson movies, Dominic accused Cody of playing unfairly and had hit himself then Cody in the head with a brick in anger before running off towards the ravine. Cody had tried following Dominic but couldn't find him and so returned to the house to get Rebecca, who in turn called her mother for help. As Rachel explains, there's, So there's a bit of distance between my parents' house and my grandparents' house in the country, and there's this huge ravine that runs more than the length of the property. Enormous ravine. So I said, Mom, why don't you stop the car halfway between our houses and my friend and I can go like walk along the side of the ravine and see if we see Dominic. And my mom was like, yeah, okay. So she dropped us off and we did that. After letting Rachel and her friend out, Julie met up with Rebecca and Cody near the house, and the four kids and Julie began searching, questioning Cody on which direction Dominic had run and how badly he thought Dominic was injured. I remember immediately noticing that Cody had blood on his face. Not a lot, um, just some, like, speckles on his face. It wasn't his blood, it was just splattered on his face. It was, it was Dominic's blood, because Cody wasn't hurt. And he was frantic. He's saying, you know, we got to find Dominic. I don't know where Dominic is. We got to find him. He ran off and we have to find him. Now becoming increasingly concerned that Dominic may be more gravely injured than previously thought, Julie attempted to calm Cody, who was still quite upset, and had him guide them to the last spot Dominic was seen. It's really hard to put this into perspective, but my mom knew Cody. She knew him very well. She knew his... Cognitive delays very well, his maturity, all that, you know, she just, she knew him and she kind of knew how to uh, work him, if you will, you know, so yeah. she told him, you know, you need to help us find him. Like, where is he? You know, let, like, let's go find him. And Cody said, okay, all right. Okay. We're, you know, I think he went this way. So he takes us to the lower part of our property behind the house and straight in, into the ravine. Now, there were all sorts of game trails that went down into the ravine, but it was very steep. You know, it's this big incline, and it was in August. So the weeds were they're like neck high in this ravine, nettles, all sorts of weeds. But we're down there, and we're trying to get like to some sort of path. And my mom stops all of us, and she says, she starts pleading with Cody. And she starts saying, Cody, all the weeds down here are still high. None of them have been knocked down. Nobody has walked through here. It's impossible for Co for Dominic to be over here. It's not possible. Where is he? And Cody's saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And my mom says, Cody, we can help him. It's okay. Just take us where he is. We can help him. It's okay. You just have to get us there. As, as I watch this interaction, I saw just a, a shift or a flip in Cody. And he said, okay, all right, I'll take you to him. And he leads us out of the ravine and all the way to the very end of our property, back into the ravine. Rachel took this opportunity to call her father to bring him home to help. And after doing so, a thought occurred to her. I turned to my mom and I said, should I call 911? And my mom was, was panicked and choked up and... I don't think she really said anything back to me, but I took that as, like, this This is bad. Because I knew something was wrong. He had blood all over his face, like splattered. We, we have to call 911. So I called. My little brother is missing. I think he's hurt. You know, this is our address. Um, we're trying to find him. And the phone call was really quick. Mm -hmm. And so that at that point, police were on their way. Then we get to the second area. And Cody leads us down. It's him, he goes first, and then me, and then my younger, technically younger sister, my twin sister. And I'm following in the water. There's this curve in front of us, and there's a down tree in line over top of this curve. I watch him duck under it and get out of sight. And I remember as I'm running through the water, I had my boots on, like cowgirl boots. So they were mm -hmm. like filling with water as I ran. So I lagged behind him a little bit. And then I, I put my hand on this tree and I ducked underneath of it. And as I came up, 
and I was rounding the corner at the same time, I saw Dominic, oh. this young boy. He was laying face down in the water. And Cody is just standing next to him like, here he is. You, what, what do I do now? And I just start screaming at him as I'm trying to run over there. And I'm screaming at Cody to get Dominic to pull him up out of the water because he was face first. And so Cody listened to me and he reached down and he grabbed like a fistful of Dominic's shirt, of the back of his shirt, and kind of picked him up by his shirt and just kind of like tossed him onto the bank. Like he didn't really want to touch him or he didn't know what to do. He had just picked him up and he wasn't really gentle, which kind of irritated me. Mm -hmm. So I run over, I throw myself down on my knees. Took Dominic over and by then Becca's next to me, my sister. And he had a big gash on his head, nice big open cut, and a cut on his lip and he was all scratched up. And He was just blue in the face and uh, just very obviously beaten you know and because of the way um that cody moved him his shirt was pulled up like so his whole torso was exposed as well and his whole torso was blue and just very distended my mom is up on the ledge of the ravine she's still up top and but she can kind of get to the edge and see us like we were almost in like a clear spot so she could see us and she starts she's wailing and screaming and telling my sister and I to do CPR and now we we were 11 we had no idea my sister tried um, she tried to give him a breath and was trying to push on his chest and I, I don't know how long I let her do that before I, I grabbed her by her shoulders. And of course, I'm crying and I can't really even speak. But I grabbed her by her shoulders. and I just shook my head like, no, just just stop. Like, there's nothing here. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Don is currently rushing out of the restaurant after talking to Rachel on the phone and decides to call for reinforcements. He tells detectives. I went out the door and... I started getting a bad feeling about it at that point, so I called my dad and hoping he was home, and he was, so I called him and asked him if he could go over there because, you know, he's a few hundred yards away instead of, you know, 25 minutes. Mick Kuhlman, the children's grandfather, immediately makes his way over to his son's house and finds his family in a complete panic. And at this point, the police showed up. They were there. So I walked up to them, and I said, I'll show you where he is. What was Cody saying at the time that you guys found Dominic face down? Stuff like, Dominic, no, no, like, how could this happen? He started saying stuff like, come back, please, come back, and... That's after said, your grandpa got there? I think he said, Lord, help him a couple times. I know one of my aunts told the police officers that they, they had to get Cody out of there before... Um, the men showed back up before my father and my father's friend got back. She said, you need to get these, you need to get Cody out of here. And I mean, it was entirely obvious that he had done it. He had the blood on his face and, and everything. It was at this point that Dawn arrives home. So then I hurried, you might say, flew home pretty fast. And by the time I got there, there was a couple of sheriff's cars and a couple of other vehicles. I didn't really pay attention to most of them. I, just rode down front and parked the bike and then walked back to where Rachel was and she said that Dominic was gone and they couldn't bring him back. And then I was looking around trying to kind of, you know, it really didn't sink in. So I was trying to talk to her and then the rest of my family walked up and as they were walking up and then it was pretty obvious what happened, you know, or at least the end result was that Dominic was gone. Okay. As most of the family stood in heartbroken silence in the yard, police began the exhaustive process of organizing and cataloging the various points of the crime scene. Officer Jeff Kilpack slid down the muddy banks of the ravine to stand next to Mick Kuhlman and Cody, the only two who remained next to Dominic's body. According to this Harrison County Police report, the officer could see a small boy lying on his back with his feet in the water. He could also see that his face was bloody and that his body was muddy. He was motionless and his color was blue. 
He checked the body for any signs of life, but the body was cold and moved as he shook it as if the body had already gone into rigor. He noted the obvious head wounds, which were no longer bleeding. The report also states that Cody was crying hysterically and said, We were playing bricks. Mick asked him, Did you do this, Cody? And Cody began to scream and cry even harder. Not only would a little boy not have the strength to inflict the severity of damage found on his body, but it seems he may not actually have been the kind of difficult child the Coolmans had expected. When discussing why Dominic's mother placed him in foster care, Julie explains how her experience with the little boy differed. So why was he taken away from his biological mom? I don't, I don't know the exact answer. I don't know. But they don't tell you that? I, you know, they just say that parental rights were severed, and I don't really like this last one. You know, I had Dominic, and I thought, why is he in foster care? And I was told she put him in foster care mm-hmm. because she needed help. So I just thought, wow, that's really... And she told you that? Or no, the case for her dad. He, you know, I was told that he could, you know, cuss like a truck driver, bite, kick, scream, attack you. And I thought, oh, great, you know. When I had him, the only thing we were working on with him, he never did any of that stuff to me. You know, Cody said he called him an a-hole. And I'm like, well, what were you doing, you know? And I wasn't doing anything. I was playing the game or whatever it was. And I'm like, well, you know. I told Dominic, you can't say that word. That's bad. You have to go stand in the corner. And he'd go stand in the corner. I'm sorry, Judy. And then um, he would say things that we were working on. He'd say, oh, my God. And I'd, I'd say, I just talked to my husband. like, he's finally got that figured out. You don't say, oh, my God. You know, say, oh, my gosh. It sounds better. He started, it, he was quick. And I was telling my husband, he's really smart. This kid is smart. And he'd say, like, me and so-and-so. And I'd say, you don't talk like that. You know, that's not how you speak English. You say, you know, like, Rachel, Pen Rachel, and I go out and play. Or we were working on simple things like that. None of it was cussing or kicking. But he did um, have to be restrained Thursday, I was told, in school. He tried to fight and kick somebody. And I said, wow, you know, and I thought, okay, so how's he going to be? But my brother was the bus driver. He said he was fine in the car. He came home. He was fine. I've never seen any aggression from this little boy, none. As Julie gives her account, her palms are down, which indicates confidence in what she's saying. In addition, her nonverbal and verbal timing are well aligned, which further indicates that she's likely being truthful. She may have considered the behavior she observed to be normal for a child Dominic's age. It's interesting that she's covering her mouth when talking about his school restraint. This is a sign of discomfort, which is to be expected from an adult who has come to care about a child. The thought of him being physically restrained would likely be disturbing for her since she hadn't encountered any issues with him at home. However, it's important to note that he had only been in the home for a few weeks, and many children with behavioral issues are able to keep it together, so to speak, for the first few weeks in a home. This is generally referred to as the honeymoon phase of placement. This happens much of the time in foster care or residential placement until the child feels safe enough to drop their guard and express themselves in a way that is normal to them. It seems Dominic was starting to feel safe and secure in his new home environment, and his foster family was starting to work on helping him improve his behavior. Whatever the reason for Dominic's placement, those around him all seemed to agree that he was, at heart, a very sweet little boy, full of affection. Obviously, officers decided that Cody needed to come in for questioning. After securing Cody in the patrol car, Mick told the officers that he suspected Cody may have been the one to hurt Dominic. Officer Kilpack then instructed the rest of the Coolman family, as well as Rachel's friend Dylan and his father, to follow them to the police station as soon as they were able to be interviewed. As Rachel described, You know, I don't know what order all of this happened, um, but I know we went inside and I got myself cleaned up. I was covered in mud head to toe. So I got myself cleaned up. I got my sister cleaned up and they had us write a statement and they said, just write down everything you, you know, everything that happened that you can recall to the best of your ability. And then we went to the police station and it was like my whole family there. My, you know, because my dad showed back up. So my parents were there, my dad's friend, my friend, both of my grandparents, um, a bunch of us were there and we were there the entire night. They interrogated all of us. I know it was really hard on my mother. 
Julie Kuhlman, the foster mother who would sadly pass away just two years after this tragic event, was beyond heartbroken at this time. As the family sat in the waiting room at the police station, various family members took turns consoling her, as in the many years of caring for foster children, and even specializing in difficult children with behavioral problems, nothing like this had ever happened. What did you think about him screaming like he was? I was freaked out. Have you ever done that before? Start really screaming? Mm -mm. Well, sometimes when he gets aggressive, my mom will restrain him so he doesn't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. And he'll, like, moan and growl at her and, you know, just... Did he do that but, at that time? Mm -mm. He was crying and he wasn't being aggressive towards us. Meanwhile, Cody, who had been hysterically inconsolable just minutes before being put in the patrol car is sitting in a detective's office, remarkably unfazed all of a sudden. The following never-before-seen interrogation has been analyzed by a licensed professional counselor and a licensed attorney. As you'll see, Cody's strange comments and bizarre antics are just beginning. It was pretty funny, but then one night I actually saw it. I was like, oh! I see it just went past my face. I slipped out. I woke up and then he jumped when he saw it. Everyone was freaking out. They thought it was a goat. Then it was gone. <laughs> yep. It seems as though this officer has essentially been tasked with the role of babysitter for Cody until another member of law enforcement is available to question him, hence answering his phone instead of making an effort to build some rapport with Cody. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. If you ask me, it's getting colder and colder now. I'm twisting up my legs to keep them warm. Bursting out my hands. That's better. There was a nice cream cone side bug, though, that was kind of weird. It looked exactly like an ice cream cone. Yet I do not understand. It takes aim and it shoots. I basically had to go through a lot of ice cream to get through. I had to do ground smash, punching, good grief. Would you grab me some coffee, please? Some what? Coffee. More coffee? Oh, really? You just drank all that? Yeah. You just drank all that? Good grief. You're I'm a coffee black drinker. Rag. What's that? Black. Yes. He sits huddled in the chair, prattling on about his strategy in the Wreck-It Ralph video game on the Nintendo DS to the detective who sits in stony silence except when talking to other officers and takes phone calls without hesitation. Well, I know exactly why you drink coffee now. But lucky for me, I don't need coffee at night. Hmm. I stay up without the meds. If I don't take my meds, then I stay up. Hmm. Awesome, thank you. I could do it for him. You got any water? I'm good. But did you need more water? No, it's all right. Okay. Besides, I don't need to get more water. Otherwise, I'm going to need to go to the bathroom. Ah, uh, sure, sure, sure. Hello. How's it going? Good. Good. I'm Laura. I'm with the DCI. We're uh, trying to hurry to get somebody with you. I know you're you've been waiting around a long time. Oh, fine. Yeah. You doing okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah? You hungry? Here we go again. You just made me hungry again. Great. <laughs> just when you, every time when someone says something about food, I get hungry. So you are hungry? Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you want to eat? Uh, I've already had a... Chips and candy bar. Just had one of both. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's good. <laughs> That's about all we Is that your favorite? Chips and candy bar? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll be right with you, okay? I think someone's going to come in here in a second. Oh, boy. Great. She just made me hungry again. Just what I need. <laughs> <laughs> if Cody's foster family's suspicions are to be believed, Cody, a 17-year-old, has just caused the death of his 5-year-old foster brother. Yet he sits here, mere hours later, talking non-stop about a video game. This is extremely bizarre behavior, and in our exclusive interview with Rachel, 
she's able to shed a bit of light on his background. Cody uh, lived with us for, I want to say, three and a half years. He was one of our longest um, kids that we had live with us. He was very cognitively delayed, um, exceptionally so. I remember my parents estimating that his um, mental age, if you will, was probably around six or seven. He was intelligent, but he was very immature, very childlike, had very childlike interests, and um, his temperament was very volatile. He has um, heard chickens before. We have one cat, and that would stomp on them. Okay. But I don't know if that's what Cody did. I, he usually throw it in the ravine. At the time, detectives didn't know the extent of Cody's mental issues and could only be disturbed by his behavior. It was at this point they placed him under arrest, though it appears they did so as calmly and gently as they could so as not to upset him too much. This seemed to work, or perhaps it was just that Cody didn't really grasp the situation evident by his reaction to the detective reading him his Miranda rights, where Cody excitedly interjects that he'd heard it before on an episode of Batman. I right. heard someone say this. Yeah, right. the right to main silence, that means you do not have to say anything. Anything you say will be can and will be used against you in the court of law. I've read that actually on um, Batman before. Mm-hmm. For minors in Iowa, both the right to remain silent and the right to counsel can be voluntarily waived if a parent or guardian has been notified of the arrest and interview, which is the case for Cody as he is over the age of 16. However, the court will still evaluate statements made by a minor to determine whether they're admissible. Factors that come into play include the opportunity for the child to consult with a parent, guardian, or lawyer, the child's age, level of education, level of intelligence, and whether or not the child was advised of their constitutional rights. Some of this changes depending on how the minor is eventually charged, such as being tried as an adult, but that happens well after the interrogation and is handled by the court. The two investigators begin the interview, chatting with Cody about his life and little details about his family, adopting light and friendly tones as they ask him questions. After a few minutes, they start by having Cody recount what happened that day before he went into the house to get Rebecca. Dylan, Rachel, and Miss J. I so forgot were, that Dylan they was there. They went to anyway, the anyway, Dylan's dad and Dawn just went on a bike ride, so Dylan's dad took Miss J's bike. Uh, they were all somewhere far away. You decided to go play in the ravine? No, we were right beside the ravine. When you say we, you mean you and Dominic. Okay. The female investigator is actually an agent with Iowa's Division of Criminal Investigation, a highly elite program that runs statewide investigations for the major crime unit. As she leads the interrogation, you'll notice she spends most of it sitting in the confession pose. It's important to know that as humans, we naturally mirror body language when we're engaged in conversation with others, and our body language can affect our openness and mood. This officer is taking advantage of this by modeling the confession pose in an attempt to get Cody to join her in the pose that is most likely to elicit honesty and a confession from a suspect. See, we were playing Roman, like Greek mythology. Sure. Not to mention, here's a little clue for you. Here's a little Greek thing, but it's just a little starter, so I way I just calm down. What has four wings and has a really, and is red, and yet it is part one of Hades' minions? Starts with an F. Hmm, I don't know. What? Fury. Oh. That's the one that I actually got Percy. Okay. I hate that thing. Yeah. Four wings, flapping separate <laughs> ways. You lost me on that one. See, two wings go this way, two wings go that way. Okay. The bottom ones go this way, the top ones go that. And so, back, back to the house, when they go to the town, it's you, and Dominic, Dominic and anybody else on? Peanut. Only Peanut was in the house, in though. The house. Whose idea was it to go outside? Miss J. Right before she leaves. 
she wanted me and Dominic to go play. Mm -hmm. So we went to play. It was a very long time when she was gone. So that's when we started playing the Roman game. And how do you play Roman game? Basically, I'm Greek, right? Okay. He's Roman. He doesn't know how to sword fight. So I tried to teach him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, I'm going to work by myself. He's basically saying that he's invincible. So what was he using? He was Roman. Well, Romans have imperial gold savers in Greek mythology. Okay. And Greek has crystal bronze. So it's kind of bad. So what were you guys actually using? Well, he had a he had the gold imperial gold. I had the crystal bronze. We just used invisible. Oh, okay. Then he picked up a stick and tried to, but I was like, it's no sticks. And he's like, all right. He throws it in the running. It's funny. It's funny how he throws. He's like, well, I'm like, are you okay? He's like, I'll be whoop. It's kind of funny. But still, anyway, back to business. So you guys playing, like, by the house, by the cars, by the animals? There's this area where... Rachel and Pina and Truman made this. Truman is their cousin. So if you want me to tell you about him right now, I can't. We'll get to him a little bit. But keep going. But you guys anyway, there is this thing that is like a portal, basically. It's basically like a barrier, a shielding, mm -hmm. like off of Greek, like off of Percy Jackson, the first one. You go like this to open it. You go through, put it down. So we started playing. I was basically in the barrier because it was weak, thanks to the mm -hmm. sure. second movie. Yeah, that all. I started fighting him. And he's like, I'm going down too. Oh, he was dumb it, dumb it. He didn't listen. Boom. What Cody is referring to here is the old rope swing that seems to have been tied to a log that set out over the ravine. Investigators would note that there was an old muddy rope lying in the bottom of the ravine, but it's unclear what was done with it. That's when he hated me. Okay, what did he, how did that happen? happen? He's basically saying, I'm going on the rope. So he just steps down. I tried to get him with the sword, but basically he said, no. So we basically went swinging down pretty hard, I guess. Probably. I don't know. That's when it broke. Did you see him get injuries to his head? I saw blood. Mm -hmm. I was like, stop it. He was tumbling, literally tumbling. And he splashed in the water like this. Face up. I saw blood going down the river. I was like, he injured? He gets up like this, and I saw a red streak going down on his head. Mm -hmm. Blood. And then what? I was scared. I didn't even go down. He just threw rocks, so I tried to dodge most of them, but one popped me in the nose, so that way the rest guided me in the arms and legs. This is likely Cody's attempt to explain the blood witnesses and detectives noticed on his face when Dominic was found by insinuating that it was his own blood from the wounds Dominic had given him by pelting him with rocks. It should be noted, however, that at the time of his intake, Cody didn't actually have any scratches, bruises, or injuries of any kind. You're at the top of the ravine. You're still on top? Yeah. I fell down after that. So I decided to scramble because one got me in the gut, though, but and it hurt pretty much. I was like, huh. The way Cody has phrased this further shows that he lacks the ability to be deceptive in a way that's believable due to his cognitive deficits. The account he tells sounds as if there are two young children engaging in an altercation, but it's not an even match. Cody is much bigger and stronger than Dominic. Clearly, he's completely out of touch with reality. I was And Dominic long. was down by the water. I was too long. He was down in the water? No, he grabbed the brick. I saw that. And he started running. I was hurt. I just inched over so I could peek. That way I could know what he's up to. He got, he noticed I was gone, so he grabbed the brick and started smashing his face and started running while he's smashing. Hmm. He stops short. He gets under. 
started smashing his face again while he's running. I didn't see him trip. Hmm. I didn't know. Hmm. Why was he smashing his own face? I know he was almost to a deep spot, though. I did know that. But I didn't know if he knew that. I don't know what to do. So I just went to grab Peanut. And she called Miss J. And she got home, right when she got home, everyone started looking. The investigators listened patiently to Cody's Percy Jackson-laced explanation for a few more minutes, but both know by this point that little Dominic's brutal injuries could not have been self-inflicted, as Dominic had sustained massive blunt force trauma to his face, suffering multiple fractures and broken teeth. Detectives also have the statements gathered from every other family member before Cody's interview, stating that everyone believed Cody had done something to Dominic to cause his injuries. For example, this is what Don, the foster father, said when asked directly. What do you think happened? Well, Cody's had a tendency in the past to lose his temper and be mean to people. And I know that he has a tendency to play. So we don't let him play rough video games or, or watch really you know, rough movies or you know, WWF or anything like that because he doesn't seem to know the difference or realize, you know, arms can be broken by just goofing off. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to think anybody in my family lied to me, so I think Cody probably lost his temper. And, and I don't know Dominic well enough to, I don't even care at this point who started it. I guess it doesn't matter. But. With these facts in mind, the investigators began to press Cody a little harder and try to coax him back into reality. You, you and I both know that's not really what happened, is it? It is. Okay. Stop being such negative. Well, Cody, we're, you know what we do for a living? We're officers, okay? I we know what you all are. The time. What is that? Really, do I have to say it? I'm not no jail person, okay? You're not a jail person? Okay. Well, well I may be in jail Cody right now, but I'm not a person that needs to be in jail. Okay, when we when they go out to the scene and they, they find this... I'm rock. not a criminal. Okay. Nobody accused you of being a criminal, okay? That's basically what you're saying. Do you know what, do you know what I think is important here, Cody? That's not hey, what we're saying. Cody, do you know what I think is important here? So when I was sitting here listening to you tell your story, I could tell that you're sad and that you're sorry that this happened to you, right? I can tell that, okay? We know that. It's intriguing to note that the moment they call him out and show they don't believe him, he barriers up with his arm and leg. Though we know Cody has some serious mental health issues, it's still his automatic reaction and goes to show how innate these kinds of behaviors are. I think what could really help and probably help you is to kind of just let it all go, just just let it all out, and all that pressure and that, that weight. There is no weight. Mm -hmm. I have no weight on it anymore. Okay. I already let it all out. Uh, I just told you everything I could about what happened. Why do you need more from that? Just because we need to... We need to make sense of the situation. And some of the things you're telling us makes absolute perfect sense. But some of it doesn't, doesn't fit. And we're just trying to get... He plays you know, baseball. I understand. What do you think I meant? He has a strong arm for batting, strong arm for pitching, why does it not make sense? If he could hit as hard with a bag, then obviously he can hit hard with a brick. I'm not saying that any of this is wrong. But right now, what you guys are trying to make me do, it's basically wrong. Okay? Just going to make me mad. For a bit of context on these last couple statements, it seems Cody is referring to whether or not Dominic was actually strong enough to hurt himself with a brick. It comes out of nowhere, 
but may indicate where Cody's mind is at this point in time. We're not trying to make you do anything. We're not trying to make you feel angry. Or you are. Mm -hmm. I know you cared about Dominic. He was your buddy, your play buddy, your Greek mythology buddy, right? Didn't know much about Greek mythology. But he wanted to. He followed you around? Mostly, yeah. Okay. So I know you cared about him. And he obviously looked up to you. Right? And I know that five year olds can be a little pain sometimes following you around. Actually, no, that's not what the pain was. What was the pain? Well, first off, he may have been good at pitching, but still it hurts. Yeah, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Nobody wants to get hit with rocks or anything. It's not pleasant. Then why would he hit himself? I do not know. Okay? Okay. So what I was telling you before is, so when our crime scene team people go down there, what are they going to tell us when they scrape the skin cells off the bricks and the rocks and the sticks? Is there going to be anything from Cody on those sticks, rocks? Brick, any of your skin cells going to be on Dominic? Excuse me? I obviously touched him. I have been doing that for a long okay. time. Here he is making a statement. An individual with confidence in their statements will place their palms down. Cody has his palms up, showing a lack of confidence in what he's saying is the reason they might find his DNA on Dominic. This position would be one of pleading to be believed, not a position one would typically make if they were certain of what they were saying. Him very nicely. Yes, that's all I ever done. I don't kill. Stop blaming me for murdering. Hey, nobody said anything about murder. Typically, when an individual is innocent, they become angry when falsely accused, while a guilty party will stay calm and try to manipulate their way out of it. The luxury of being out of control and angry isn't something they can afford, as they need the officers to like them. Guilty people are typically more focused on the manipulation of the police officers, and anger doesn't normally make people like other people. However, Cody isn't this sophisticated. He isn't trying to be liked or trying to manipulate the officers. He doesn't realize that he needs to. Okay. That's what it basically sounds like. I'm not a killer. We're trying to figure out what happened to him. Okay? You were with him, and you're the one that can tell us what happened. It's interesting to note here that Cody's anger at the accusation is not a typical reaction seen from guilty suspects. Excuse me? How am I supposed to know how to tell it? I'm not that clever. What do you mean? Hmm. Who is the killer is that actually besides? Anyways, there have been men down there before. Down in the ravine? Yeah, okay. lots of people down there. Who have you seen down in the ravine? Well, I know I saw one guy, but I didn't know who he was. He had a cloak. A cloak? Like a little, just like um, Harry Potter except with a hood. Okay. I didn't understand that. We saw him before. Uh, I don't know, me and Pina and Gage. There was a kid named Gage. Sorry about saying, not saying that. Anyways, there were, even Will was there back then. But Pina, Gage, me, Ben, and Will. Okay, when was that? About, I don't know. Probably about, Probably a long time ago. Long. Not recent. Not since I've Dominic seen, was there. But one time when I went on in the ravine all my own, I also saw the same cloaked figure, except inside the ravine, picking up pipes and storing them in his bag. Like he, and there was also a gun down there. He picked up that and put it in his bag. It was had bullets. I know that because I checked before. I've seen that gun before. 
I was like this. I hid. He looked my way, and I was like this. I didn't tell anyone. Didn't want to. I was too scared. But my guess said he was there. I didn't know. But I saw footprints. Why the the cops? Yeah. Right? When the cops came and they were grabbing me, I noticed footprints. I looked at the corner of my eye and I saw footprints, big ones. Same exact size as the feet of the cult's figure. I don't know who he is or where he came from, but I think he hurt Dominic. That would be my guess. He probably tripped him and drowned him because he doesn't drown that easily. He's a fighter. I know that. Because I usually just play around and wrestle with him, but he's pretty strong with me. He just pushes me down real hard. Okay, you just said Dominic doesn't drown that easily. So we're going to find out that he drowned? That would be my guess. Okay. Cause Have you ever seen him drown before? Well, he doesn't know how to swim. I know that. I hate that cloak figure, whoever he is. I hate him for killing Dominic. If he did. It seems Cody slips up when he says he doesn't drown that easily. He then attempts to cover his tracks by saying that he hates him for killing Dominic. In addition, his statement, if he did, comes across like a qualifying statement. His level of deception isn't sophisticated, and it's as if it's too anxiety-inducing to fully commit to his story. Do you think he did? I think so. I saw footprints. I know I did. I don't know more details. Miss J knows that I talk. Because every time I find stuff, even out of the corner of my eye, I find stuff that no one else sees. According to psychologists, people who are faking psychosis will say things like, I see and hear things that aren't really there. But most people that actually have psychosis or delusions just assume they notice more or hear more, that there's an explanation, and that others just don't notice it, especially when they're young and new to the diagnosis. They have no idea they see or hear things that aren't there. This is a strong indication that Cody does, in fact, suffer from psychosis. Have Even in the overground. Have you seen that guy in other places other than the reading? No. Uh, wait, yeah. Cornfield once. But right by, which is close to our house. Because I was running away before and I saw the cold figure watching me. He's like eyeing me. I just booked it. He noticed that I was running away. He smirked. I noticed that. I was like, it's creepy. So I just ran off. The second time I ran away, I saw him again, smirking. I didn't understand. So I shot at him. You know, as I saw him, he ran. He literally ran. I didn't catch his face, though. I know one thing. He had discolored eyes. Really weird. Two different colored eyes. Hmm. You must have been pretty close to him. Yeah, I was running to the side. I noticed him in the fort. I saw two different colored eyes. I was like, oh, hmm. I think one was green. I know one was green, but the other one, I'm not so sure. Around this time, the detective interviewing the rest of the family asked Don Kuhlman about any strange men he may have seen on his property. And while he had nothing more to give them on strangers in the ravine, he did have a very interesting detail for detectives about Cody. Cody's a habitual liar. Absolutely nothing comes out of his mouth is true. It takes a long time to get to the bottom. But when it finally does, then usually you can see in his, his eyes and his face and his mannerisms and finally you kind of feel that he's, or realize he's finally telling the truth. And he'll blame everybody for else, you know, try to make up stories and none of them jive and none of them match. And I mean, if one, when we were on vacation, he's got into some all the little rolls kids eat. Fruit rolls or something like that. Yeah. Like, like the little round of cupcakes, ho-hos. Stealing food is a common enough behavior in children who haven't been able to trust that their needs will be provided for by the adults in their lives. It's a trauma response rooted in neglect as well as a defense mechanism. They'll eat the whole box 
Well, first he said Rachel did it, and then he said Becca did it, and then he said Dominic did it, and then he said this person did it, and that person did it. And, well, there must have been people home that could have done it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, that's, that's the way he, he always has been. Like me, you stand in the corner and write some sentences or something, and mm -hmm. eventually he gets sick of it and tells the truth. It seems that Cody is used to lying in an attempt to stay out of trouble, which, like stealing food, is a protection mechanism. While this is common in all children, it's especially persistent in children who suffer from neglect and have experienced physical violence as a response of having done something a parent or guardian considers to be wrong. Parents who behave this way toward children are often inconsistent in determining what makes them angry on any given day. As a result, children who experience this type of treatment cannot clearly establish what is right and what is wrong in the eyes of the parent or guardian. It's important to acknowledge that Cody likely learned this behavior prior to coming to live with his foster parents, and this analysis does not reflect on them. The worst of the problem is the longer it takes. Mm -hmm. This, I doubt will ever tell the truth, at least not all of it, but he might. Mm -hmm. I don't With this in mind, the two exhausted detectives begin to wrap up for the night, as it's now about two in the morning. The female agent leaves the room to meet up with the other detective who is interviewing the rest of the Coolmans, leaving the male detective to wrap up with Cody. It's getting later. What time is it? Two o'clock. You mind if I say this word? Crap. It's... I'm not even going to get enough sleep, am I? Hm. I don't know how well I think you're going to sleep tonight. Think you'll sleep pretty good? Mm, yeah. I guess take it, not taking my meds will just keep my mind occupied anyway. Excellent. Yeah, I usually just play around. That usually keeps my mind off or read a book or even play video games. But still, it will take my mind off anything. Yeah. I'll try to get my mind off of it. I try and try. That's why I'm reading right now. Sure. Accidents have occurred mm -hmm. when family members have borrowed or loaned a firearm and return. Holy shit. What has happened with Dominic tonight? It's going to be hard to, hard to forget. Be, if you ask me, it's going to be a load. Hmm. How many times have you seen a child be murdered? Hmm. More than once. Okay. So then it could be anything. It could be anyone that is a child murderer. You have possibly a lot of suspects. Hmm. Not really. Well, I do know this. What? I think possibly the other eye of the other guy was possibly brown because it was a little bit darker. No, I don't think, I don't think we're going to focus on him too much tonight. Yeah, not for now. Mm. But if I see him again, I'm going to shout, if you're there, I'll go, kill you. Yeah. I bet he'll just smile. Yeah, I have a feeling we won't run into him. Huh? I have a feeling that I won't be running into him, so. I pro I have a feeling that I might. You might. Because so far in my life, when I was with Miss Jay, I've been running into him for a long. Does he kind of show up when bad things happen? Mm-hmm. He shows up every time. Every time. Right outside the house, in the woods, hidden. Except I could see him. Right. Pathetic hider, if you ask me. But I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that. So maybe he was good at hiding, but not to my eyes. Sure. I don't know what's going on. But this time he was around when something really, really bad happened. Yep. Something that is not supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to. But it did happen. But it wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to. I know. It wasn't supposed to. Yet I saw footsteps go farther down the ravine. 
Mm-hmm. What I'm going to do is try to track him down a little bit. See where he hides. If I find something, I'll tell you. Okay? Because mm-hmm. there might be more information on him. I might find out where he lives. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm not too... Not too no. Whoever this guy is, I'm going to see what I can do. Mm-hmm. I have an eye for detail. Mm-hmm. Who knows what this guy's been up to? But please don't tell Miss Jade, otherwise she's gonna go out of whack. I think she has enough, enough to worry about to concern herself with right now. Exactly. That's the reason why I don't want to worry her anymore. Mm-hmm. That's the reason why we shouldn't tell her this. Otherwise, she'll be much more worried. You shouldn't tell her what. This guy. The guy I'm telling you. I'm not. I won't bring him up at all. I don't think anyone should. Mm-hmm. But I will try to find something about him. I guess I don't know. I know. I'm just saying. If there's anything else that I can do, that I can find out about him, I'll try to see if I can. Yeah. The only thing, else, maybe the only thing else that you can do is, well, I think all the valuable information has come is from Cody. Hey. But it's up to you. I already told you as you much information me? as I can. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What, you think I have some hey. stored up? Hey. I ain't mad at you. No worries. I do, though. Yeah, I do think so. But that's... That's just me. Hey, I have a lot of memory here. Yeah. But not a lot. Enough to actually memorize everything. Right. May have a juggernaut memory in here, but because Miss J has seen me solve puzzles like none other. Right. And she tell you this. Because I was playing the game that was a puzzle solver, and she tell you this. How'd you get through that so fast? Well, she tell you this. I'm a puzzle solver. What do you expect? The only puzzle that I have right now that I can't quite put together and it's up to you but my my question is because I I mean I don't know you that well I just know you a little bit I know I can and what, understand that and what I do know of you I mean you're a pretty laid back kid you're funny <laughs> got a huge imagination uh, very a- very active you know yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. pretty athletic on at sure. school yeah. And I guess the, the only thing that, that I can't figure out that only you could answer for me was, you know, down there with Dominic, was it an accident or was it on purpose? It, I know that's, it was an accident. That's the, only, that's the only thing I can't figure out. I know it was an accident because... That rope was not, I made sure it was tight and good. I made sure the log was made sure not to be broken. I tested it. I jumped on it. Here, the investigator has posed the alternative question, as he's given Cody two choices for what happened, one being more socially acceptable than the other. Cody plays right into his hands and chooses the more acceptable option, which is still an admission of guilt. So it was dirty. I don't know. But I know there are a lot of termites over at the house, and even term, um, house, like wood ants, ever heard of those? Mm-hmm. Those things are everywhere in our area. Mm-hmm. So it's probably been chewed up by that. What's going on? So it's probably been chewed up or by those ants. Because uh, I noticed that there were colonies of ants pouring out of the logs, so I knew it was probably ants. So I know it was an accident, but Dominic did. Do you do you find yourself thinking about death and stuff a lot? Yeah. What? I think that I might. I, I just keep on thinking that I might die. Yeah. In a different fate that is so difficult to complicate. As soon as the detective leaves the room, Cody makes a grab for one of the pieces of equipment lying on the table nearest him. 
He stares at it for a minute before seeming to come to a realization about what it could be. Yeah, huh? Okay. Let's see how much you like it. Hmm? You really don't know why I know, huh? Okay. Let's see how it is. I won't tell you anything else. Unless you record. The investigator has shown signs of irritation with Cody several times previous to this most recent foot tap. His leg has been twitchy. He switched to closed-off body language and barrier positions with his leg a few times. He doesn't appear to have much internal patience with Cody's childishness and emotional ability. Externally, however, it seems he's doing everything he can to stay patient and keep Cody talking. Well, guess what? What? I'm not telling you anything else. I don't like recorder people. Okay. I'm not much of a media person. Thank you very much. It was at this point Cody refused to speak further with investigators, and they eventually would move him into custody for the rest of the night. Cody may not have admitted to what he'd done, but at this point it was obvious to the detectives that he had killed his foster brother. Though now they would have to turn to the rest of the Kuhlman family for why Cody had done something like this. Like I said, we had Cody lived with us for several years, and he was he was very sweet. You know, had an issue stealing things, you know, especially food and and just had weird things he would do to break the rules, but he never was malicious. It's like he just, he had no inhibitions. He had no, you know, um, self-control, but he was never malicious. You know, he was a sweet kid and Dominic, of course, was five. Um, so he was just kind of really displaying a personality uh, at that age, but he was very, very sweet. He was very cuddly, you know, and, and he and he and Cody got along great. They played all the time. They followed each other around the house, you know, and we all, we all kind of commented on that, that they mentally seemed to be at the same level. We all thought it was pretty cool, honestly, at the time yeah. that they kind of both had a buddy. Cody seemed to genuinely adore Dominic, and he had no actual history of seriously injuring another person, either before or after being placed with the Kuhlmans. Whatever violence he displayed seemed to be confined entirely to temper tantrums, bouts of screaming and yelling. He never expressed a desire to hurt anyone else. Detectives found themselves struggling to come up with a reason for this crime, since no one had an idea for what could possibly have been Cody's motive. The rest of the family, Cody's teachers, friends of the Kuhlmans, all were at a complete loss for why. Cody's background may offer some insight, though it was revealed much later in the investigation. As it turns out, he allegedly witnessed physical abuse in his original home, although whether Cody was ever directly a target of this abuse is unclear. Cody reportedly cowered severely, huddling on the floor whenever reprimanded by men with raised voices, sometimes staying in a crouched position for up to 20 minutes before slowly getting back to his feet, indicating that he may have had an even more troubled past than caseworkers knew about. As well, Cody's mental challenges, such as his diagnosed ADHD, may be a result of both genetics and the substances his mother used while pregnant with him, specifically meth which she stated at his trial was at least 
$20 worth every day for the first three months. Prenatal meth exposure can lead to developmental delays, including cognitive impairments, problems with attention and memory, and difficulties with motor skills. Additionally, children exposed to meth in utero have an increased risk of developing behavioral issues such as ADHD, impulsivity, aggression, and difficulty with self-regulation. In hindsight, Dominic being placed in a home with Cody may have been a disaster waiting to happen. Rachel Kuhlman, now an adult working as a highly respected army medic despite only being in her early 20s, sums it up best. I mean, there's so many things, you know, that could be said that, you know, this should not have been allowed or this shouldn't have happened. But there really, there was no predicting this. Right. And there was no avoiding it. You know, if it didn't happen that night, he very easily could have attacked Dominic another night or he could have attacked me or my sister, right. you know, or he could have never done it. But there is no knowing. Um, right. I have been under the opinion that Dominic should not have been placed with us um, just because, you know, in, in hindsight, it's obvious that sure. it shouldn't have been. But again, at the time, there was no knowing. and Right. You can't forecast this. Yeah. If you thought he was odd in interrogation, just wait, because he saved his strangest story for trial. It was then that the truly ridiculous final excuse Cody gave for his actions was revealed. On the 5th of November, 2014, Cody testified that he did, in fact, kill Dominic by smashing his face with the brick and holding his head under the water at the bottom of the ravine. This is obviously quite a departure from Cody's earlier statements of Dominic inflicting his own injuries and the mysterious cloaked man with one green eye, although Cody still maintains his innocence. You see, that day he claimed he didn't actually think he was killing his foster brother with a brick, but that he was slaying the goblin commander of the goblin army with a shining sword and the brick. Yes, you heard that right. A goblin commander. Cody claims he was so deep in his fantasy world at the time of the killing that he didn't even realize the person he was hurting was actually Dominic. This was also a departure from his story about the Percy Jackson game, especially since there don't seem to be any goblins in the Percy Jackson universe. Instead, Cody was now saying these were the goblins from the video game franchise, Skylanders. As bizarre as this story may seem, we ask Rachel for her thoughts. Do you remember much about what was said about Cody? And, you know, I mean, there was one, one time where someone, you know, he used a defense of like, hey, there were goblins and I was trying to intervene and, you know, all of, what do you remember? And now that you're older, what do you think about what you heard? Oh, uh, well, I remember it being very hushed. You okay. know, people did not talk about it. Okay. At least not when, you know, I was in the room or my sister was around, you know, people did not talk about it. It must have been maybe my parents who mentioned it. Um, but I do remember hearing that, you know, he was pleading insanity. And uh, that that was what he said, that he saw goblins and that he thought Dominic was some sort of monster. and. It wasn't surprising that that was what that was Cody's story because um, he was ex extraordinarily imaginative. You know, he could sit down by himself and just just create this huge elaborate story. And he would sit there and act it out and talk to himself and move and and he would he could be entertained by himself like that for hours. Well, okay. um, and you know, he loved video games and he loved any, anything that he could explore his with his imagination was something he, he really enjoyed. So, yeah, I remember, I mean, I carried a lot of anger for a long time. So I think there was a part of me then that didn't want to believe him. But looking back on it now as an adult, you know, I don't have any idea what he was thinking, but I do know he was extremely cognitively delayed. and. He, he very well could have hallucinated and thought that he was fighting some sort of monster. You know, I, that's not far-fetched at all. However, there is an odd discrepancy about Cody's Goblin Commander story. At the time Dominic died in 2013, there were three Skylanders video games out, and they feature creatures called trolls, not goblins. 
Now, this is actually an important distinction because not only is it rather odd that someone so obsessed with the game's mythos would get such a basic detail wrong, but this might be an indication Cody is lying. This is particularly interesting because if this is indeed what Cody is referencing in his testimony, then it couldn't have been what he was allegedly seeing in August 2013. A goblin commander doesn't appear until Skylander's Trap Force, the fourth game in the series, which came out on October 5, 2014, only a month before Cody's testimony. Considering how many outlandish lies Cody has told up to this point, it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to imagine that when coming up with the latest lie, he simply incorporated details from the game he was playing at the time of his trial. This is pure speculation, mostly because we couldn't find any information on where Cody was being held before his trial, but we thought it was intriguing nonetheless. In Cody's new story, he asserted that he had been in his own world during the time of the killing, and therefore couldn't remember it at all. The defense called a psychiatrist to testify that, yes, Cody could have very well been engulfed in a highly immersive fantasy which led to an almost psychotic break, where he killed his foster brother without realizing it. Yet the prosecution called their psychiatrist to say no. Cody not only remembers exactly what he did to Dominic, but he actively lied to investigators and made up elaborate stories to hide his role in the killing. In cross-examination, Cody admitted he told different people different stories based on symbols he could see floating above their heads, which indicated whether or not he could trust them. Again, this seems suspect, as he told three separate lies to the same pair of investigators within the span of a single interrogation. As is often the case, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle of the prosecution's story and the defense's. Regardless of what was actually going through his head that day, Cody Metzger Madsen was found not guilty by reason of insanity in November 2014. It seems this finding is often misunderstood. It must be established that at the time of committing the offense, due to mental disease or defect, the defendant was incapable of either knowing or understanding the nature and quality of his or her act, or distinguishing the difference between right and wrong. Insanity is evaluated at the time the defendant committed the offense, so a person may appear sane later and may even understand how irrational their actions were. But the question is, what was their state of mind at the time of the crime? It's also important to consider Cody's cognitive and developmental delays. It's surprising that he was found competent to stand trial, as in most states a child under the age of 10 cannot be prosecuted since it seems that there was a consensus that his mental capacity was under the age of 10. It's remarkable that he was able to meet the requirements for competency, and those involved believe it's likely he will spend the rest of his life in a mental health facility.